I know I use the word favorite a lot. Like if you've been around a church long enough, I probably say favorite about every third verse that I ever get to talk about because uh, I'm kind of a Bible nerd. But like I, I'm not exaggerating when I say this really is my favorite day of the year. Um, and if you've been around church this week, you know there's a lot of work that goes into what happened and services on Thursday and Friday and like we were at the park in the sun yesterday and then sunrise service this morning at six and then here um, and you know from the outside it might look like it's really exhausting but it was amazing to look in the eyes of my staff this week and they felt the same way I did like this matters you know today is a really special and incredible day it's always funny to me to talk to some of my colleagues uh, back home that are also in ministry and they're like you get the Easter sermon fixed yet and I'm like you talk about it like it's a problem, you know, like it's the best thing we get to talk about all year long. It's my favorite story to tell. It's, it's the best thing. Uh, it's why we are who we are. It's, it's what binds us all together, right? Uh, no matter what people, um, where you're from, no matter what your, your background is, no matter whether you like church or not like church or whether you were hurt by church in the past and came back or you grew up in a really conservative church or whatever, like it doesn't matter. We're, we're all together on the one idea that today Jesus is alive is alive. Um, and if you're new to our church, what I'm about to say might, might be a little bit of surprising to you, but the beautiful thing to us that we talk about all the time is that we don't just believe that Jesus is alive because the Bible says so. It's so much better than that. We, we believe that Jesus is alive. We, like, we believe he's alive and rose from the dead because Matthew said so. Matthew, right? Matthew who was a tax collector who lived in the first century. Matthew who uh, had a, a whole team of scribes and people that worked with him. Matthew who, who uh, was, was kind of scorned by society, uh, but for some, some way, somehow found his way following Jesus around after he said, hey, Matthew, come with me. Matthew decided to record a story of things that he watched, seeing things that he saw, things that he experienced. And so Matthew wrote this gospel, this book we call the, the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew. And he recorded it wrote it down for us. We believe because of Mark, right? John Mark, who actually wrote down Peter's story, was the scribe for Peter. Peter, the apostle Peter, was more than likely illiterate, and so he would just talk, and he would tell John Mark these stories, and, and Mark would go, hey, tell me that again. What, what did Jesus say? How did Jesus do that? What is it exactly that happened? And so Mark began to write down the stories that Peter told him, right? And so Mark write these stories down because they were so impressive and so impressionable on him and so important that he didn't want them to be forgotten. We believe because of Luke, the doctor, right? Luke, who at the very beginning of his letter, his gospel, he says, I set out to investigate everything that happened with Jesus and to write down an orderly account so you would actually know what went on. Mar uh, Luke, who basically refers to himself as the very first investigative reporter, right? That he says, I want to know, and I know you want to know what actually happened with Jesus. So I went and talked to all the eyewitnesses and some of the things I witnessed myself, and I wrote them down. We believe because of John. John, who was a disciple of Jesus, he was one of the eyewitnesses of almost everything that encountered with Jesus. In fact, he stayed with Jesus longer than many, most of the other disciples did. He was the youngest at the beginning. He was the one who, who, who really stuck to the inner circle of what was up with Jesus. He wrote down the story. All of the good and all of the bad and everything in between. Even the parts of his story that made him feel uncomfortable about himself. The decisions that he had made. We believe because of Peter, the apostle Peter. Wow, what a story Peter had, right? An illiterate fisherman who Jesus comes along and says, hey, Peter, follow me. He tells John Mark his story, and so his story is recorded in the Gospel of Mark, but he also wrote some letters. Letters that the early church in the first century, right after the resurrection, they're like, wow, this is really important. These are, this is a really big deal. This is someone who walked with him. We want to keep this. We want to hold on to it. And then I know I say this every Easter, if this, you know, this is my third, fourth Easter with you all now, uh, and I know I say it every year, but James, we believe that Jesus rose from the dead because of James. Ha Listen, James, the brother of Jesus, called his brother Lord. Now let me just ask all of you that have a brother, what would your brother have to do in order for you to call him Lord? Right? I love my brother. It ain't happening, Right? And in fact, the funny thing is, James didn't even believe that Jesus was who he says he was until after the resurrection. There's no mention of James until after the resurrection. And then all of a sudden, James comes on the scene as a guy who believes. And not only does he believe, he's leading the church in Jerusalem. And he's telling everybody, like, yeah, that was my brother. And he, he really did what he said he was going to do. And he died, and then he rose from the grave. And, and so we believe because of James. We believe because of Paul. Paul, who came on the scene as a, as a Christian, who, or a person who hated Christians. In fact, he persecuted them. If you don't like Christians very much, you and Paul would really get along. 
Because Paul couldn't stand them. He thought they were heretical. He thought they were crazy. He tried to stamp them out. And then he became one. He met Jesus on the Damascus Road. And he became one. And then he became a really great one. And he planted churches all around the Mediterranean Rim. And he wrote letters to them describing what it looks like to follow Jesus. And then probably the one um, that, that if this person could, could speak today would probably be furious that his name is remembered in the same ranks as Jesus. We believe because of Nero. Uh, this may come as a shock to you, but Emperor Nero, who was the emperor of Rome uh, in, in about 54 AD to like 60 AD when he burned the city to the ground, um, Nero hated Christians. But the, if you don't know anything about Nero, the two things you probably remember from history class is one, that Nero was the one that burned down Rome, and two, who did he blame it on? Christians. Why was he able to blame it on Christians? Because there were Christians living in Rome. This is why you pay me the big bucks. Right? He was able to blame it on Christians because there were thousands of Christians living in Rome in 50 AD. Okay? In 50 AD, there were thousands of Christians living 1,500 miles from Jerusalem. And Nero, in his memoirs, and in his letters, and in everything that's recorded about him, hated Christians. He didn't like the way that they kept calling Jesus their Lord, and they were great citizens, but they would not fall in line with the whole political campaign. They wouldn't shut up about Jesus being their King, and their Lord, and their Savior, and it just drove him nuts. We believe because Emperor Nero was so frustrated with Christians that he burned his own city to the ground and blamed them so he could get rid of them. We believe that Jesus rose from the dead today because the eyewitnesses who eyewitnessed, because the historians who wrote it down, because of the people that were there, because of the people that experienced. And as the first century wound on, the church went, these documents are so important that they put them together and they packaged them with the, what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. And one day, a couple of hundred years later, after all of this, the Bible came together. We believe because something happened. Now, I'm a history nerd, if you couldn't tell from the first three minutes of this message. I love studying history. But you may be sitting here asking a question that I asked when I was young, or when I was growing up in church, when I was kind of like half connected to church. So what? So what? Okay. So what? Let's just say, you know, does Easter really matter? If, if Jesus really is who he says he is, does that actually matter? Does it make a difference in my personal life? How does it make a difference in the way that I live my life? How does it make a difference in my marriage, in my, in my parenting? How does it make a difference in my job? How, how does it make a difference in the way that I go about my life Monday through Saturday? And I'm so glad you asked that question. But in order to answer it, I have to tell you part of a story that illustrates what a real person went through when they were wrestling with the same question. What a real person wrestled with when they were trying to understand what it looks like to follow Jesus in the day-to-day, -day, even when it's hard, even when it's tough. And a real person who actually failed and talked about their failure, wrote down their failure, told other people about their failure. So I want to spend just a few minutes telling you the story of Easter through the eyes of the Apostle Peter. And I'll explain why in a minute, but I just want you to see that when he talked to John Mark and Mark wrote down his information about what happened on that Easter Sunday morning, he recorded it. We find it in the 16th uh, chapter of the Gospel of Mark. So if you open your Bibles, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, right, John. Those are, the first four, those are the four Gospels. Mark is right in there at the beginning, okay? And Mark says this about what happened on the first Easter Sunday morning. Now, it says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, who is mentioned throughout the gospel as someone who Jesus had healed and set free and had kind of followed him around ever since then, her life was so transformed by what he'd done that she couldn't seem to want to leave. Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. This is a really important detail because this means they were preparing for a funeral, not a celebration. Right? They didn't go to the tomb and, and were awaiting sunrise for Jesus to walk out. That was not what was on their mind. They were going to have a funeral. So they bought these spices and they prepared probably the words in their mind they were going to say and, and they were going to be, you know, uh, do the best they could to prepare him to, to stay in the tomb. That's, they, they just expected him to do what dead people do, which is stay dead. And then it says this, very early on, very early on in the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, 
who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? That's a really good question. This massive rock has been rolled in front of the tomb because there had been rumors that Jesus was not going to stay dead. And the Romans, who were in charge at the time, didn't want some sort of crazy thing to happen where there was like a switch, bait and switch kind of thing. So they stationed guards in front of the tomb. There was a giant rock rolled in front of it, and then everybody left. And so they're questioning amongst them, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Then, but, but, when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. Remember, Peter's telling Mark this. So, like, the women came running to him, and after the fact, they're reprocessing everything. And he's like, yeah, we got there, and the stone had been rolled away. It was so big, and it was crazy. We, don't know, we, we, were, we realized we didn't even know how to get it away, and it was already gone when we got there. And then probably the strangest sentence of the entire thing, because this may not be what I would do. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. <laughs> because if you walk into a grave and there's someone sitting there like it's really calm, of course you're alarmed, right? This feels very real. This doesn't feel like somebody who's making it up. They're like, I walked in, and I don't know what possessed me to walk in, but I got there, and it kind of worried me a little bit. And then this sentence, don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. Like, look, here's where he was, but he's not here anymore. He is risen. But go, go and tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. Now, here's what I want to interject for a minute and, and pause the story and tell you a few other things. Because there's something going on in this verse that when you read it normally, you just kind of read through and it doesn't register that something big deal happening. But I, I want you to see this right here. And Peter. Go tell his disciples and Peter. Now, a few minutes ago, I just told you, Peter was a follower of Jesus. He was a disciple. He was one of Jesus' inner circle. So why, oh why, on Resurrection Sunday, on Easter Sunday morning, would this angelic being say, tell all of the disciples plus Peter? Well, to understand that, you've got to go back just a couple of days in Peter's story. Now, Peter has always been a guy that I kind of associate with in my own life. He was emotional. He spoke first and thought later a lot of times, and did things before he thought them through, kind of a shoot first, shoot second, aim later kind of guy. And so Peter was always the one who got them into trouble with things. Peter was always the one who just spoke what was on his mind and then kind of wanted to backtrack from it. And a few days before this, Jesus had been talking to his disciples about his own death. He was warning them that he was going to go to his death and that, that this betrayal was going to happen and that all of them would be scattered. He literally looked at them and said, all of you will leave me, and I will stand alone. And Peter, bold, emotional, brash, human Peter, says this. Even if all fall away, I will not. Now, I want you to notice again, this is in Mark's gospel. So Peter looked at Mark when he's telling the story about what happened, and he told his own story. Yeah, I was there that night, and Jesus said we were all going to fall away, but I looked at him and said, not me. Not me, boss. No way, no how. I am with you till the end. And Peter records through Mark that Jesus said this, Truly I tell you, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. Now, Peter, again, he's, he's getting indignant at this point. He's getting really upset. And in fact, he records it. It says, Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Now, what ended up actually happening was that shortly after this happened, Jesus asked him to go out to a garden. And they're supposed to pray. He asked them to sit up with him and pray that night. And so he says, I'm going to go out here just a little ways. I want you to stay up and pray with me. And they could see that he was bothered. Something was really bothering Jesus that night. He'd said some strange things during dinner that they didn't fully completely comprehend. And they was getting to this place where, where he was really uncomfortable and it looked like he, he might not be feeling well. And so Jesus goes out a little bit further than them. They're in the garden. They fall asleep. Jesus begins to pray. As this goes back and forth for a few hours, finally Jesus says, could you not sit up with me for just a few moments? Look, my betrayer is coming now. And they turn around, and there's a mob, like a, a group of, 
of soldiers and, and leaders from the synagogue, which was like the, the holy place, the, the, the religious leaders of the day, They're, they've come into the garden at night. They've got torches. It's like a torches and pitchforks kind of thing, okay? And they come into the garden, and right in front of them is one of Jesus' followers named Judas, one of the guys that had been a part of the crew, that had been with him throughout his entire ministry. And so all the other disciples gasp, right? And they're all frustrated, and they're, they're angry, and they're upset, but they're just kind of in shock. And the strangest thing happens. Peter pulls his sword. He's ready to defend, you know, he's ready to defend the guard, uh, Jesus to the death and, and, you know, slice all the guards and all the things. And Jesus tells him to stop. And so they watch as Jesus is chained and, and arrested and drug out of the garden. Now, Peter at this moment still looks like the I will never leave you kind of guy. But as the night winds on, he has to watch his friend go through some really terrible things. And Peter begins to become afraid. And in fact, in, his, in, in the Gospel of Mark, which is Peter's words through John Mark, he records that he became so terrified that just as Jesus said, he began denying that he even knew who he was. And what I love is, throughout all of the Gospels, okay, throughout all the Gospels, all the Gospel writers, they documented their own disbelief. They documented their own disbelief. They didn't just say, yeah, you know, well, Jesus said it was going to happen, and I was the only one that believed the whole time. None of them did that. In fact, they all said, sooner or later, like, Jesus said this, and I just thought he was kind of crazy. Or Jesus said he was going to do this, and I watched, and I ran away. I was afraid. Or I didn't understand what was going down. I didn't know how it was all going to come together. And Peter's story, just so you know, what, what Peter tells us through his own words is that he believed, and then he unbelieved, and then he denied that he ever believed. And I just want to take a minute, for all of us who have ever felt like we're the end of the story, like go tell the disciples, and, have you ever felt like you were kind of on the outside, or you felt like you went through this weird process of like, well, I kind of sort of believed when I was a kid, and then, then somebody said something, I started to unbelieve, and now, like, it doesn't even feel popular to believe anymore, and it feels like, well, I'll go to church on Easter, or Christmas, or some other time, and I'll sit in the back, or, or I'll go because... You know, maybe you're here because they give you a free lunch. Again, it's totally cool. I'm not guilting anybody, all right? But maybe this is your story, too. You know, I, I believed, and then I unbelieved, and now I'm like, no, I won't even tell anybody I ever believed. That's crazy. You got a lot in common with the Apostle Peter, except you might be missing the last piece of his story. Because what we find out is that, that Jesus rose from the grave, and, you know, there, there's this kind of picture, again, if you go back to what I read a moment ago, that, that maybe Peter wasn't even with all the disciples at the beginning of the, the, the morning, right? That it says, go tell them and find Peter and let him know too. But eventually, sooner or later, Peter and John come running to the tomb, and they see that it is the way the women had told them, that Jesus is not there, that he is risen, that something has happened. But Peter still felt like an outsider, Peter still felt like an and. And it wasn't until Jesus showed just how personal he is by, after the resurrection, inviting Peter to breakfast. Like, it's so cool that they, they sit down and have breakfast. Like, Jesus is risen from the dead, right? Uh, and the thing that he wants to do is go have breakfast with Peter. It's beautiful. And what we realize is in that moment that, that Jesus could have done anything, okay? He's been resurrected from the dead. He's alive. He, he, he could have gone and sat on the throne. He could, have, he could have gone and, you know, ransacked the town. He could have done whatever he wanted. But what he wanted to do was go after the one he cared about so much who had believed and unbelieved and then denied he'd ever believed and help him not feel like an outlier in this story. And I personally have felt like God has done that for me. More times than not. When I felt like I didn't belong in the story, when I felt like I didn't have a chapter, when I felt like maybe it was for everybody else and not for me, God has gone out of his way to make sure that I felt like and knew that I was loved. And so he has breakfast with Peter. Peter's reconciled. And then, again, Peter becomes this great leader in the church. In fact, he becomes so bold and so brash and so incredible. I'm going to read you one of his sermons in a minute, just like a little brief of it. But he won't stop talking about who Jesus is. And there's no more denying, okay? There's no more denying Jesus from Peter. He has been redeemed, he, but, but more than that, he's been reconciled. He went through the toughest moment of his life and came out on the other side with a king and a friend. 
Not, not just a Lord, not, not just the Savior, because he was all those things, but, but, but a friend, someone who's personal, someone who knew his name. And I think that makes all the difference. And so later, when Peter is a leader in the church and he's talking to Christians, he's trying to help them be encouraged about following Jesus even when it's hard. He says this in his first letter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. I love that. Like our Lord. Now he's back in the story again. Not just the one that the disciples had, not the one that I denied anymore. He's ours. He welcomed me back. No matter what I'd done, no matter where I'd been, I am in now. And you are too. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into, and I love this phrase, a living hope. Not like a theoretical hope. Not like an intellectual hope. I, 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 I consider myself to be an intellectual. I love to read. I love to study. I love to think. But this is not a, theolog- the- a theoretical or, or intellectual exercise. This, this is practical. This is hope living in me. Hope living in you. Peter says this. He's like, but this great mercy. He's given us this thing that defines life. That makes life better. And we live in it. We get to live it day to day, looking at the world differently. Praise to him. New birth and a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It was only because Jesus was resurrected from the dead that this happened. And so Peter, again, he's making a theological statement, Jesus is alive. But more than that, he's going, this is why it matters. To all of us are asked the so what, he would say, because you can live with hope now. And then he continues, because this is another part. Like, if that's not enough, there's one more piece of this. He goes, and into an inheritance that can never perish. Something that has been given to you. You've been given something in Jesus that cannot be taken away from you. It won't be taxed. It won't be stolen. uh, It won't fade. It won't spoil. It won't break. You've been handed something in Jesus that will never perish. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. The other thing, just point this out real quick. Until Jesus came along, all of the, the Jewish people of the day didn't really believe there was a heaven. Uh, they just believed you lived a really great life, and then when you died, that was it. And so Jesus comes along. One of the reasons they were so frustrated with him is like, no, God has another story. There's another chapter to this. Life is eternal. Life is forever, and, and God wants you to be a part of that. And so Peter, who had been so far on the outside, now finds himself on the end and is told about this great gift he's been given that will last forever all into the new presence with God. And he finishes up by saying this. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. We can't forget that Peter, Peter saw the worst thing happen to the best person he'd ever known. Peter watched the worst thing happen to the best person he'd ever known. And he says this. (laughs) For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed, saved. Not just like bought, like it says bought. And I know we in the church, we we talk about that a lot, like we've been bought with a price. But this this is reconciled. This is made right. This is brought back into the fold. I don't know if you've ever had a relationship, an earthly relationship that's broken, and it feels like it's broken beyond repair. Like you had a friend and you guys were really close, and then something happened and you just drifted apart and now it feels weird. When you're together, this word, this word implies that that relationship we have with God that was kind of weird and uncomfortable. Maybe we did some things we didn't like. Maybe we said some things we shouldn't have said. Maybe we thought some things about him that maybe we didn't. That God is bringing us back. And we've not been bought with silver and gold. We've been bought with him, with Jesus. But with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So to Peter... And to us, as Jesus' followers today, the resurrection punctuated the point of the crucifixion. The crucifixion doesn't really matter all that much if Jesus doesn't walk out of the grave. And the suffering that came as a part of that doesn't really matter all that much if there's not hope on the other side. And Peter, gosh, Peter had experienced all of that. The suffering, the the being on the outskirts, the feeling like he wasn't a part of the story, the, the watching his friend go through something he couldn't explain. And then he goes, all that stuff... Well, now I look at it differently because Jesus is alive. 
And just to prove, as I close this out, like just to prove how far Peter had come from that moment of like denying Jesus three times in the crowd and cursing a little middle school girl. I'm not making it up. Read your Bible. You should read it. It's in there, okay? To prove how far he'd come from that moment, in the third chapter of the book of Acts, which was written by Luke, is another, you know, again, he wrote his gospel. He also wrote this. It was kind of part two. And in the third chapter of that, there's this recorded sermon from Peter. Peter who couldn't read. Okay, Peter, Peter, who was illiterate, gives a sermon. And Luke wrote down the pieces of it. And he says that, that, that Peter said these words to a group of people who were trying to figure out who Jesus was and what they should do about it. He says this, and it starts off a little churchy, but I'm going to explain what it means. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Now, you hear the word repent, and uh, immediately we all think like the Billy Graham movement, and, and it's awesome. Like I grew up hearing fire and brimstone sermons when I was a kid. Repent, and it's like this big, heavy word. But the word repent just means turn in a new direction. And he says it again to prove it, turn to God. What I love is Peter is just telling his own story and his own testimony. I was moving away from God, and I decided to turn towards him. I had made decisions and, and done some things that, have, that put some distance between me and God. But now, through Christ, I have this opportunity. I turned back to him. I made a decision to move in a new direction. And now my life has hope. There's not guilt in these words. There's hope. And my friends, that's why today matters. Right? I mean... Without Easter, without the resurrection, if Jesus really isn't alive, then none of this stuff really matters. But if Jesus really is who he says he is, if Jesus really is king, if he really is Lord, if he really did die for you and for me, well, then life looks completely different than it ever possibly could have looked. The circumstances look different. Our marriages look different. Our parenting looks different. Our jobs look different. Our gifts look different. The way we look at the world looks different. The way we think about relationships is different. Everything is different if we live in the hope of Jesus. And so today I just invite you, and I, I'm not going to emotionally manipulate you. I'm not going to make you say these words out loud. I'm not going to do that to you. But I just I want you to ponder for a minute. I'm going to give you some time. I'm going to pray. And then we're going to close out and let you take family photos and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay? But I just want you to think for just a second. If you've been on the outskirts, if you felt like Peter, like the people were telling a story and you were the and on the outside, you have been invited by a God who loves you to step into hope. And there's enough of us in this room that have experienced that, but we would tell you it would be the best decision you've ever made. Peter says, turn in a new direction so that your sins may be wiped out. And I love this, that times of refreshing may come. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for this gift um, of Jesus, for the, the resurrection, for the, the hope that is found in the empty tomb. God, we are here because of that today. Lord Jesus, for those that are sitting in this room, listening to the sound of my voice, that are, they're, they're still on the fence, um, they're, they're still nervous, they're still a little antsy, they don't know what they can get behind. Would you bring times of refreshing into their lives as they turn to you? Would you, would you just encourage them to, to give you a chance to turn in a new direction? Because when we begin to look up, we find you. Help us to find you today. God bless us as we leave this place and give us safe passage and help us to come back refreshed and renewed and ready to continue to follow you into the days that are to come. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Easter.